Good evening and welcome to Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. My name is Dave Tozar and we're going to continue our study of Daniel. Um, appreciate you joining us tonight or um, if you're going to watch later on YouTube, um, we welcome you there as well. Um, join me in a word of prayer, if you will, and we'll get started. Lord, thank you for uh, this opportunity and what you reveal, reveal to us through Daniel and all of your word. Uh, we ask that you make something new and real to us today that will help us going forward. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In the first three chapters of Daniel, we've noticed, or I hope you've noticed, um, that Nebuchadnezzar was not quite right. And what I mean by that is he would frequently go from being a pretty rational guy to, uh, we're told, he would fly into a fury and a rage. Um, there seems to have been some sort of emotional dysfunction uh, lurking in the background. Uh, and some, it, some time had gone by and it looks as though, I, I don't know if it was a, a bipolar situation that finally went totally off the rails or what. It's hard to say from this distance in time exactly what it was or if it was something that was simply God-induced uh, when the time came. It's hard to say, but the chapter starts um, here in chapter four. It's kind of interesting that with what follows, um, Nebuchadnezzar apparently is talking to Daniel and Daniel's recording the words. Uh, he's starting with a praise of sorts or a personal testimony about an event that comes after the beginning of his commentary. Uh, this is a little different, but he starts the chapter not with the horror of what he's going to go through, but his recovery uh, and the peace that he had found in his heart as a result of the event that took him for some period of time. This peace that he found in his heart only comes with squaring yourself away with God, with finding peace with God. The earthly king, Nebuchadnezzar, states here in the beginning of the chapter his proper place in the order of things and God's proper place over everything. Let's start with verses one through three. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Well, that's a little different for Nebuchadnezzar. Verse two, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Um, this is a personal testimony. And just as kind of a side note, um, throughout the chapter, Nebuchadnezzar is uh, kind of enamored of the uh, personal pronouns. He likes to use I and me a lot. Um, and this is one thing here, but it's good that he does because again, this testimony that he's giving is personal and he's relaying it himself. In verse three, how great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now in verse four, he begins to relate another dream that he had. And the wise men are called in, uh, and once again, they're unable to interpret the dream. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has apparently mellowed a little bit over time because he's not asking them to tell him what the dream is. He's willing to tell them the dream He's asking them to interpret its meaning. Um, it was God who gave both of his dreams to Nebuchadnezzar, and only God is able to interpret him. So finally, Daniel is called in. I don't know why Nebuchadnezzar waited to call Daniel and called the wise men, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, the soothsayers, etc., etc why he would call them first, because they had failed him 
at least one other time that we know of, and I suspect had failed him um, altogether with anything of importance. But Daniel was called in because Nebuchadnezzar knew that Daniel was a spirit-filled man and that interpretations were given to him by God. Um, as kind of a side note, uh, note that Daniel, uh, his title to the Babylonians, even though he was um, kind of a prime minister in all of Babylon, but his title was chief of the magicians. Um, I find this fascinating myself because on the one hand, Nebuchadnezzar has learned that only God could give the interpretations, yet they considered him a magician. I don't know, maybe they just couldn't figure out what else to call him. But the whole is found in verse 17, and it's important to note it at this point before we even get started. And verse 17 says, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. God says that he puts on the thrones of this world the basis of men. In other words, God gives us the kind of rulers we deserve and the kind of rulers we ask for. There have been many rulers through history um, that have been insane, quite frankly. Um, God says he sets over the kingdoms the basest of men in 2,500 years of history since Nebuchadnezzar has demonstrated the truth of this statement. But that's verse 17, but you need to keep that tucked in the back of your mind. Now, what was Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Basically, he saw a mighty tree a mighty tree that provided sustenance and protection to all, all people, all beasts, all animals, all birds. Um, everyone could find protection, housing, food under this enormous tree. The tree was in, uh, so great in stature that it reached into heaven. Um, I'd like to draw an analogy, just stop here for a second and draw um, a comparison, let's say. Um, in approximately this same spot, uh, several thousand years earlier, a man named Nimrod had gathered all of the people uh, that had come off the ark and had proliferated, and God had said to disperse and populate the world, had gathered all those people in this area and built the Tower of Babel that they wanted to reach into heaven so that man could get to heaven and could get to God on his own without any help. Well, that didn't work out too well for Nimrod. I think it's interesting that Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the tree, the tree reaches into heaven itself. Um, well, God didn't let that happen, but be that as it may, I just wanted to draw your attention to that. The tree, tree provided uh, sustenance to everyone. Nebuchadnezzar then saw a watcher coming down from heaven, and the watcher orders the tree to be all but destroyed, leaving only the stump, and the stump is left with bands of iron and of bronze, a band of iron and bronze, uh, to keep it secure. The birds and the bees scatter to the hills. Um, the tree is no more. The watcher then begins to speak of the tree, not as a tree, but as a man. In verse 16, let's start there. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. 
Verse 17, this decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest or basest of men. Verse 18, this dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, declare its interpretation, etc., etc. Remember, Belteshazzar was Daniel's name in Babylon. Now who are these watchers, or who was this watcher and the holy ones? Watchers and holy ones are an order of God's created intelligences. They're created beings, like angels. The watchers and the holy ones are, are the holy ones who administer the affairs of the world in God's absence or God's uh, place, if you will, like prime ministers uh, do the work or the um, ministrations of a king or a prince. The book of Daniel makes it very clear that God has created intelligences who administer his universe and the world in which you and I live. God has his administrators under which, um, that operate under his commands. Against that, the prince of the world, Satan, has his demons who operate within the world as well. And they have charge over um, areas, nations, people, etc. I'm not sure. Uh, fortunately, Satan hasn't revealed to me exactly what his uh, alignment is or his hierarchy, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, we'll see more of this in the book of Daniel. By the way, these watchers and holy ones are also mentioned in Genesis chapter 18, Isaiah chapter 37, and of course in Revelation verse 16. So Nebuchadnezzar has had this dream. Daniel is going to tell him what the dream means, the interpretation of it. Uh, Daniel starts out and he's pretty reticent to do this. Um, number one, he has already been told by God what the dream means and he realizes that this isn't really gonna be good news to Nebuchadnezzar and uh, we've already noted his rather erratic personality. So we don't have any idea how he's gonna take this, or Daniel doesn't. Um, so that may be part of it. Again, another part of it may be that um, Daniel has realized the mind sickness of Nebuchadnezzar um, and become his friend. He may be praying over Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has apparently taken very good care of Daniel and his friends. Nevertheless, Nebuchadnezzar says, don't worry, Daniel, tell me what's happening. I'm not going to be upset. So Daniel goes ahead and follows uh, the instructions that he's given. And in verses 19 to 26, he tells Nebuchadnezzar what's happening. Um, and basically he says, the trees you, just like the, uh, the head, the gold head on the statue, you're the tree. You have a great empire. You're providing for everyone. You are great. You are mighty. But that's not going to last. You're going to be cut down. You're going to be cut down. And you're going to suffer a trial for seven years. But at the end of that time, and this is represented by the stump with the iron and the bronze band, you're going to be restored to your kingdom. But you're going to be a different man when you're restored to that kingdom. So off they go. And interestingly enough, nothing happens for a full year, 12 months. In fact, in 12 months, Well, Daniel tells, let me back up, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar prior to this that not only is the tree you, not only are you going to be cut down, but I'm going to suggest, and this was pretty bold of Daniel, I'm going to suggest 
that you stop sinning and behave righteously. Daniel was pretty bold to say that to Nebuchadnezzar. Again, the somewhat erratic Nebuchadnezzar. He also said to stop beating your people down and have mercy on the poor. Stop doing that. Change your ways and perhaps God will put off his chastisement. Then a year goes by. And starting in verse 30, we find out that not only did he not learn anything, but here he is and he says, is not this the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. You can kind of picture Nebuchadnezzar up on the, the hanging gardens of Babylon. And, and there's no question that Nebuchadnezzar had some mighty things done, but I doubt he ever picked up a pick or a shovel. Um, it wasn't by his mighty power, except for that he had the power to tell someone else to go do it. Be that as it may, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon was a man-made mountain 400 feet high. And it had hanging gardens and terraces and pools and all these things. And all this luxury was built solely as a gift to amuse his wife. So I can see how if he could have or have caused something like that to be built, he could be um, somewhat boastful and say, look what I can do. I can give all of this to my wife as a birthday present. I can do anything. The Bible tells us in the end of verse 30 and verse 31 that before Nebuchadnezzar even got the last word completely out of his mouth, the ax fell, no pun intended. It says in verse 31, 32, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over, over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And so it happens. Nebuchadnezzar is stricken with full-blown insanity. And off to the fields to eat grass, he, grow, he goes. Um, there are a couple of things here I think are important. Uh, we already know that Nebuchadnezzar is going to get his kingdom back. But I need to tell you that as it's stated here, they drove him from men. They drove him out into the fields to be one of the beasts. Uh, to be in that kind of vulnerable position in an eastern empire or kingdom was not an enviable place to be. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I mean by that is, it's amazing that seven years, seven years, Nebuchadnezzar would be on all fours, eating grass, and living literally like an ox in the field. And no one would take his kingdom from him. I can tell you that many kingdoms were lost by men in the prime of their life and strength. Not only in the east, but in the west. It is only because God had put an iron band and a bronze band around that kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar retained it when he was made whole again. There's no other explanation because I assure you that Nebuchadnezzar was not consulted on matters of state as a groveling ox out in the field eating grass. And I would also submit, we can't prove this biblically, of course, so it's just my opinion, and it, 
is up to the same scrutiny that yours is, that Daniel and perhaps his three friends held the kingdom together for Nebuchadnezzar. They were God's tools to keep the kingdom whole because God had promised in this dream that Nebuchadnezzar would return to the throne. In any event, so it happens, but there are three things that we should note from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. One, the most high rules in the kingdom of men. If you think God has abdicated today and withdrawn from their universe, think again. Nations rise and fall to teach people that God rules and overrules the kingdoms of this world. If you think our nation, the United States of America, is some kind of special pet to God, you're entirely mistaken. There is absolutely no reason that it should be. God is no respecter of kingdoms or nations. He uses them to fulfill his plan, just as he used Nebuchadnezzar to punish Israel and Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, I should say, Judah. I believe that we are already being judged. Look around you. Um, I know that there are people that say that, uh, that the coronavirus, all this kind of stuff is not a judgment. Well, I don't know how they can know that. Um, I tend to think that it is. And I think we are deserving of judgment. But though at any rate, God rules the kingdoms. He rules our nation just like he does everywhere else. The second point we should remember is he giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now, most of us today, well, for a century now, probably think that voting and Democrat, at least in this country, and Democrats or Republicans are the people that put um, men in power. They think they do, but God disposes of these kingdoms, including this one, according to his will. Someone may get a puffed up chest and say that um, I'm occupying this office by the will of God. Uh, well, in a matter of speaking, you are. Um, but a lot of kings in the past have had the foolish notion that they were ruled. Don't believe a word of it. God put them there to fulfill his purposes, not theirs. Notice that Paul says in Romans 13, 1, the powers that be are ordained by God. And the third thing we should remember, he setteth up over it the basest of men. This third statement should be humbling to Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Independents, to all of mankind. If you think we pick the best men, we don't. All you need to do is read human history to see this, at least wherever men were able to choose. God setteth up over it the basest of men. We get exactly what we deserve. People complain about the government, our Congress, that sort of thing. Well, my friends, we put them there. We voted for. Verses 34 to 37, the prophecy has been fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar returns to his senses and his empire. He is a converted man. Now, not converted in the sense of salvation uh, as in the, we have in the New Testament. God, Nebuchadnezzar has come to understand and believe the God of the universe. Notice as we read this, he also does not issue any more nonsensical 
um, decrees like we're going to pull you apart and burn your houses down. There's none of that. He praises God for teaching him truth and justice and the consequences of pride. I submit to you that two things. God has done this for a heathen, for a pagan, for someone who had no notion of God Almighty and in fact worshipped Marduk, who was the national god of Babylon. He called on Daniel to interpret dreams because Nebuchadnezzar felt that God was like, Almighty God was like the king of the gods, like the god of the gods. Not the only god, but the head god. It's like he was the biggest king of the kings of the world, or at least so he thought. In verse 37, he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the honor and honor the kingdom of the king of heaven, all of whose works are true, and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. God took time to humble a pagan. That should give hope for all of us because if he will do that for that man in that time, he can certainly do that for anyone now. Nebuchadnezzar was an example to all of us of how we can get caught up in who we think we are. Especially if we fill some sort of position of importance, we have an overabundance or an abundance of money, of material things. There are any number of reasons. Heck, I've known people that couldn't rub two nickels together that thought they were all that. There are all kinds of people in the world today who believe they should be listened to more than any other person. Nebuchadnezzar was brought low to be brought right. And I believe basically we all need the same thing. Is God judging us now? Or is he just letting us go? It's like Paul said in Romans, I have given them over to their ways. I've tried, and I'm paraphrasing at this point. Um, God's saying, I, I tried. I tried again and yet again been trying for 231 years in this country of the United States. He stopped listening to me long ago. So I'm just going to let them have what they want. This is an old story or an old bit of history from the Old Testament, but it's just as applicable to us today as ever. Now we have finished with chapter 4 and unlike what I have usually done in the past, I'm going to give the intro to chapter 5 um, because we seriously change gears here um, so that next week we can get right into it. Between chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, over 20 years have passed um, probably more like 22, 23 years. And I'm sure Daniel and his buddies have been busy because they are still in the positions that they have held uh, when Nebuchadnezzar was around. But Nebuchadnezzar has died. And 20 years have passed um, where someone else has been king. Now, 
Nothing noteworthy happened that God felt like Daniel needed to record in the official record of the New Testament. Um, God isn't really interested in giving details. God only has his writers put down what pertains to his kingdom and his plan. He's not interested in human details unless they apply to his plan, uh, his kingdom. There are two rulers in Babylon at this point. Um, as we enter chapter 5, uh, Belshazzar, not to be confused with Belteshazzar, who is Daniel in Babylonian, but Belshazzar. And until the middle of the 19th century, historians and literary critics uh, claimed that the book of Daniel was not authentic because in the record, the Near Eastern records, there was no mention of a Babylonian king named Belteshazzar. In fact, they knew that the last king of Babylon was a man named Nabonidus because in 1854, several clay cylinders were discovered, were actually um, uh, in three different locations uh, found to uh, uh, archae archeological digs but the four cylinders were covered, they were clay, and they were covered in cuneiform inscriptions, kind of like Sanskrit impressions in the clay when it was wet and then allowed to harden. And they named Nabonidus, king of Babylonia, and his son, Belshazzar, was regent. And let me explain why. Nabonidus was not in the line of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, when Nebuchadnezzar died, um, Nabonidus, via a coup, uh, took over control of Babylon. Now, he was trying to change over the worship of Babylon from Marduk to the sun god, moon god, Sin, which is an odd choice of names, but be that as it may, so he was never in the capital, Babylon. He was always out building new temples. So his son, Belshazzar, um, was regent in his place. As the chapter opens, the two of these men, as well as all of their citizens, find themselves besieged by the Medo-Persian Empire. You'll recall that the Medo-Persian Empire was the second Empire to come along um, through the interpretation of Daniel's or Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's first dream. There was the golden head, which was um, Nebuchadnezzar himself, and then the chest and the arms, which were the Medes and the Persians. Um, and the Mede, uh, Medo, what was called the Medo Persian Empire, is ruled by Cyrus the Great. Um, they, are, they find themselves besieged by Cyrus the Great. Um, apparently, Belshazzar, the regent, does not take it very seriously uh, because um, he's entertaining guests at a rather riotous occasion, a party, um, which we'll find out next week. Um, so that's chapter 4 and in the intro to chapter 5, which will begin next Thursday night. Uh, join me with a word of prayer, please. Thank you, Lord, for um, using something that happened 2,500 years ago to speak to us as clearly today as it did to those active participants um, who, who were there at the time. Uh, maybe it speaks more clearly to us now. Uh, it certainly has more meaning than an old story of history in a dusty old book. Help us to realize and remember that you are in control, that you will put on the thrones of the world who you choose. And many times, because of what we've asked for, it will be the basis of men or women. Lord, this is a call to all of us 
to repent, to look into your word and to believe it and to obey it. It is not for us to pick and choose those things which we like that are contained in the Bible and to practice them when we feel like it. There will be a day of judgment. The Lord, in the meantime, we ask you to refresh the hearts of all who hear, to open the eyes of all who can see, so that they know the critical nature of what you're trying to tell us. We ask you to be with all those who are with us tonight and to keep them safe and bring them back next Thursday. In Jesus' name, amen.